someone playing piano during the song? Christy. Okay, so I'll do Sit of Me. Thank you. Sometimes I forget. I just sit here. <laughs> just like waiting behind me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have told you that. Uh, I would have figured it out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll avoid an embarrassing eye, eye glare. I'm going to join in worship with you. Please stand with us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King of the Lord.
the fourth the trophy that will never set me free. Slipping out the hearts and minds before it's judgment. I slip my soul to answer him. Did you really my feet? just a few things that I want everybody here to be aware of this morning. If you are a guest or visiting us for the first time, I want to invite you to our Welcome Center in the church foyer. We have a small gift we would like to give you, as well as provide any additional information about our church community that may be of help to you. The communication cards are located in the pews in front of you. Please keep us posted on your most up-to-date contact information. And if you're not receiving email updates from the office, be sure to check the box on the front of your card. On the back, we want to invite you to share prayer requests so that we can partner with you in prayer. These requests are prayed for weekly by the church staff. If you check the prayer ministry box, know that others in the church will be praying for you as well. And of course, be sure to check the confidential box for any private concerns you have. You can turn in your communication card at the Welcome Center or use the contribution boxes which are located in the church hallway. If you're interested in supporting Lynchwood financially, this is also where you can give by cash or by check. If you prefer to give electronically, Please visit lynchwood.org, go to the side tab, and click the contribution link. Finally, we want you to know that we have a staffed nursery as well as a nursing area available for infants and small children. For children ages 4 to 11, you're going to be dismissed partway through the service for Children's Church. Parents, if you have a child that is going to participate in Children's Church, please make sure you sign them in each Sunday at the child check-in station, which is located at the nursery. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. And now we want to inform you of just a few more things that are currently happening in our church community. Good morning, Lynchwood. Really glad to see everybody here. And I know there's also um, probably many people that are on, online uh, watching us right now. And uh, I've, I think I say this every month I'm up here. I love Sunday. I love coming to Lynchwood. I'm excited about being here. I hope you are too. First thing, uh, a few announcements that we have. We have communion this week, first Sunday of the month, and there are communion packets, I believe, at every doorway, not just over here like I tend to point to all the time. And um, also, right after the service, over in the Heritage Room, for those that... Oh, I'm sorry, Welcome Center. I keep on... Brian's correcting me. Okay. Might be a long... Long uh, time up here for me. Uh, now, if you feel, um, I don't know what the cri criteria is, but if you're newer to the church, Brian would like to meet with you. And if you're part of that, or even not part of that, right after church, we are having um, a single to mile luncheon, and that will be over in the gym. And since we're having the luncheon in the gym, that means there's no link today. Although, you're, of course, more than welcome to talk about service while you're eating. And then immediately following the luncheon, there is a car wash uh, for the uh, people that are going to Mexico. So um, you stick around and get your car wash. I think if you're part of the team from Mexico, you should just sneak out, get lunch real fast, and start washing people's cars anyway, and then bill us. 
So, you know. And uh, I've mentioned before that this church likes to eat. Well, next Saturday, there is a breakfast at our, our church, 9 a.m. It'll be over, I don't know if it's going to be the gym or the fireside room. And uh, I hope you attend. I believe, Brandon, you're sharing. Am I correct? Okay, I'll make sure I got that right. And uh, I'll take suggestions on what needs to be served because I'm in charge of the meal. So, you know, and so I need some suggestions on what to burn. So anyway, they, they, they survived a lunch and our breakfast I had last week at the retreat. So maybe they'll survive this one. Uh, in a few weeks, May 22nd, 6 p.m., we're having a family uh, music sing time. If you have the gift of uh, singing or feel like you do, That'd be my case, feel like I do, but maybe I don't. Please sign up. And that's at 6 o'clock. It'll be a, a time of sharing in music. And um, I, I really uh, hope, hope you were there. That would be great. And on uh, Friday the 13th, they say that Friday the 13th it doesn't sound right, does it? Sounds like a bad look. There's going to be a concert here. The Cragans will be uh, sharing. It is a free concert. It's at 7 p.m. And the admission is free. And then coming up on the 15th will be the Huff Newton uh, wedding shower. That is Sunday the 15th at 2 p.m. And I um, hope that you'd come and uh, support this couple as they uh, will hopefully be married for uh, many years to come. Also, I believe somewhere around here, oh, okay, I can just see it right through by the water fountains. We're having a change offering. That is going to the uh, trip of Mexico. So if you got some change, or maybe. Some one dollar bills or five or twenties or hundreds you want to get rid of. <laughs> Put it in there, they would appreciate that. And um, we probably want to support, you know, where they get home too, not just where they get, you know, we have a one way trip. So, you know, make sure to pull out a little a few extra dollars if you can. And coming up on Tuesday, the men meet uh, in the chapel at six thirty for momentum. I have to say I have not attended yet, but I Plan to go this Tuesday, so I don't know if that just made the attendance possibility go up or down, but anyway, I would hope that uh, many of you men that if you're available can attend that. And then finally, which we've shared this before, uh, there's a prayer time over in this room at 9.30, it's on Sunday morning, and uh, I think we had six this morning, and we're only in there for 15 minutes, and you know, it's prayer for our church, for our community, and that this church can... Uh, make a difference in the, in the world. And, um, and as you stand, uh, as we come to prayer, please stand and please remain standing. I had a thought that this week was the NFL draft. And I know you're like, what is that got to do with church? But all these players were hoping to get selected to a team. And I was thinking about this this morning. We're already chosen. The Lord has chosen. We just have to accept it. And I hope that we have that attitude. The Lord has chosen us. Now let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning. Um, I already feel your presence in this church, and I know it's going to continue. And I ask that uh, all of our hearts will be open to what you have to say, and that we will leave a different people um, shining our light for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Give my
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. song heaven's mercy seat. sing that again worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb who was slain holy holy is he sing a new song to him who sits on Your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. With all creation, I sing praise to.
lost and broken, and in frail old ships sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the wind. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You may be seated.
guys so well. Thank you, choir. You know, I was, I was thinking about <clears throat> was thinking about what to share this morning and for communion. That was a Martin Shroud original, and when you try to Google the words, they don't pop up. And so I thought, oh man. And the verse that came to my mind was John 13. Of course, we've been in this section recently, but now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to be with his Father, having loved his own who are with him in the world, he loved them to the end. <clears throat> and during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come forth from God, that he was going back to God. He got up from the supper. He laid aside his garments, and taking on a towel, he girded himself. He poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. <clears throat> These words of grace. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, in Jesus' really most desperate hour, how many of you guys have had a crisis in your life? And... Other people have problems, but they're smaller than yours. I think that happens to all of us. But Jesus had a pretty big thing staring him in the face in this moment. And rather than dwelling on his own life and his own self and his own interests in this precious moment with his disciples, he said, what is it that they need from me? What is it that I can give? And he didn't take his own personal crisis as the center of attention, but he expressed these words of grace, these moments of grace with his disciples. And he continued to pour out selflessly to his disciples, even in his greatest moment of need. That's the love of Jesus Christ. Scripture says when we take communion, that we are to remember. Remember what he did. And what I want us to remember this day is I want us to remember this sacrificial, selfless love of Jesus Christ. That at the moment of his greatest need, he was still thinking of your greatest need. Let's pray together. Jesus, as we come to the table, you have invited us to remember. And I just ask Jesus that um, we could learn more and that we could see more clearly of your love for us. Help us today as we dive into your word, as we continue in this spirit of worship to see how much love you truly have for us. We know oftentimes in our times of need, we revert into selfishness. But Jesus, you poured yourself out all the more. And so as we, as we look at the cross before us today, help us to remember your great love for us. Amen. At Lynch with Church of God, we practice open communion. And basically what that means is you don't have to be a member. Actually, we have no membership, so that's not going to work. Uh, you can be visiting us with children. We ask that you would help your children to understand, and when they're at the age in which they understand, you can teach them to participate. But this is between you and Christ. Paul admonishes us to examine our own lives and our own hearts before we come to the table. We don't eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. In other words, I, I warn you, do not take this in vain. It's a holy, sacred thing that the Lord has given us. And if this doesn't profess his death and resurrection to you, we simply ask you, we refrain, no one would judge you, we're glad you're here. Uh, but let's take of this together. The night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. He says, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen? Amen. We ask that you use this also as your spill container. Uh, Pastor John? Aren't you glad you're part of the family of God? Turn to your neighbor left or right and say, I'm learning to like you. <laughs> and mean it, and mean it. <clears throat> you know, God is good. God is good all the time. And he takes our gifts and talents and uses them for his glory. And uh, take your yellow sheet, if you would. We've just listed a few things that are part of the family, but I'm going to cover a few more if I could. Uh, our Mr. Dan Ryan studied long and hard and hard and long. And I think his wife and Kathy could concur. But he passed his, let me get this right, his CFP, what uh, a certified financial planner. Let's congratulate him. So if you need some help, there he is. <laughs> God is good. We had a wonderful men's retreat, and the Lord really poured out his blessing. Thank you for... Uh, praying for us and for Dr. Lou, who did a beautiful job when we were away. Um, and obviously, I must mention that, and she doesn't want me to, but thank you for praying for my wife. And she had a very successful heart procedure. And we give God all the praise. Amen. <laughs> and then yesterday was a beautiful service for Paul Zook. I know Jean is here this morning. And Gene, our, our hearts and our love reach out to you at the passing of your son. Nora Watson fell and broke her leg. Prayers are with Ed, her husband. Myrna Booth needs hip surgery. And uh, Brooklyn Huff, kidney stones, I understand. And then Travis, uh, the grandson of the minors, uh, has type 1 diabetes, and we want to be praying for him. Many concerns to pray about. And maybe there's a concern on your heart that maybe just by an uplifted hand, you say, I got something I want to take to the Lord, and the Lord sees those concerns. Would you stand with me, please? Uh, and if, if sitting is better for you, that's fine, too. The altars are always open. Let's just spend a few moments just thanking God for his goodness, for his blessing, for his love, for his provisions and for eternal life. Father, you told us to be still. And unfortunately in our, our world, we're so busy running to and fro that we forget to stop and smell the roses, to enjoy a beautiful sunset to listen to the voice of God speak to us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to direct our lives. And we're so thankful, God, that you sent your only begotten son that we could have a personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, through your son. And Lord, we've come this morning to say thank you for many answers to prayer. And we've only listed a few, but but you have been answering prayer all along and you want to continue to touch us physically and emotionally and spiritually and financially, whatever our needs are. And we would want to pray for our dear sister Annie. She's fought a tough battle and now 
starts infusions. And Lord, for Lenora, who has dealt with so much pain, and I just pray that you'll be with her in a special way. And for our dear friend, Myrna, who needs surgery. Father, the list goes on and on, but your provisions go on and on as well. You're a gracious God, you're a loving God, you're a forgiving God, and we're thankful that we can assemble here today and worship you, for there's many places that they can't do this. And so we pray that you'll receive our praise, receive our love, and Lord, take our lives as we've just shared in communion, committing to be your followers, to be your, your disciples today, to bring light and leaven and salt to our family, to our neighbors, to our community, wherever you place us, Father, we want to be used of you. And so now I pray that you'll just be with Pastor Brian as he opens the word and, and uh, speak to our hearts, Lord. Challenge us, use us, and send us out to be followers of Jesus Christ. We love you, we praise you, for we ask it all in Jesus' powerful, precious, healing name. Amen and amen. We on? All right. Jackie's asked to be anointed this morning. Uh, you had the opportunity to meet Jackie. Jackie, I'll give you um, uh, just a quick moment. Can't do it. I'll, can I do it for you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Jackie, here, I'll get this back to you. <clears throat> Jackie's daughter, Erin, uh, is handicapped severely and is as big as you and does not communicate well and is violent. And Jackie's a single mom trying to take care of Jackie with very limited support. Um, she bears the marks of a daughter that she can't control and doesn't know what to do with and loves her daughter and is running out of steam. And we as a church need to surround her to uphold her before the Lord and to pray that God would give her the strength and the support that she needs to love her child as Christ loves her and that she would know that God loves her as well. So church, will you come? thank you that we as a church can just gather over Jackie right now and uphold her before you because she needs your grace and your mercy more than ever before. Lord, her flesh has run its course. Her energy is out. Lord, her earthly hope is exhausted. She needs a divine touch from you. And so, Jesus, we ask that you would just come in power and that you would minister her in the depths of who she is, that you would strengthen her. You gave us the promise that those who trust in you will not grow weary, they will not faint. Even young men grow weary and stumble and fall. But those who wait in the Lord will renew their strengths. They will mount up on wings of eagles. And I pray, Lord, that she would mount up on wings of eagles today. And, George, Lord, we just also pray for Aaron as well. Father, that you would give her a healing touch, that you would take from her these things, Lord, that, that cause her to, to lose control and to lash out. Father, we know that you have the ability to minister to her at a place that we can't because we don't have access through her mind, but you have access to her spirit. And so we ask, Jesus, that you would come and dwell in her in the deepest places of who she is, that you would give her a calm and a peace and a hope. May she know you in the core and the depths of who she is, Jesus. And so we uphold the Kepinger family before you right now and all the trials they bear. Lord, everything from finances to finding a job to a new place to live to the care that they need. And Jesus, we ask that you would provide for all of these things according to your riches and glory because our resources are exhausted, but yours are just beginning. So we look to you in faith and we ask Jesus, that you, more than anything, that you would grant my sister faith and hope this morning. And may she know that you love her and that she has a church family around her. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Children, you're dismissed. Good morning. morning. Open your Bible to Matthew. Matthew 16. Sixteen twenty four. Our favorite verse, right? Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Holy Spirit, as we come to the Word of God today, we ask that you would be active in revealing to each individual heart what you want us to hear, what you want us to do, and who you want us to be. We're here to offer our lives to you. 
Help us never to forget that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, anybody seen one of these before? What's that called? Tripod. Tripod. It's ingenious. You know, a lot of technology went into this. They say it took Thomas Edison 10,000 tries to come up with a light bulb, right? Or at least the working prototype. I wonder how many tries it took to come up with with the tripod. I would say... Three. <laughs> How many licks does it take to get the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? <laughs> I'd say it took about three. You know, the, this is going to be it all clunky and get in my way now. Um, the irony of the tripod, though, in what I want you to notice with the tripod here, is that as we started early, right, if this were to try to stand up on one leg, You have to work with me here. I'm I'm new at this. This is difficult technology. (laughs) This one's broken. We'll leave this one out. There we go. If if we are to try to stand it up on one leg, right, what is the only position that it just might stand? Straight up. Totally vertical, right? Totally vertical. Because when it begins to tilt in any direction, it's inevitable. It's going over. Right? As soon as it leans, it's gone, it's in a compromised position. Leaning is a compromised position, and standing up straight is the only potential that it has to stand. But isn't it interesting, right, that when the three work together, that it's actually the leaning position that makes them stable. So the very position... That's a really noisy tripod. The very position of leaning, which is, which causes it to lose its balance on its own. If it was to try to stand alone, the very position that compromises its strength, when it joins together with others, it's actually that position that gives it its strength. In other words, the tripod has to be in the very compromised position is actually the strong position when they come together. The irony of the tripod is that the posture that would weaken it alone is the posture that strengthens it together. In essence, it's the vulnerability of each branch. It is the surrender and the trust that gives it its strength. And if I were to have a longer throw here in the middle, what you would find is that the wider and the more that it leans upon itself, the more stable it becomes. Put that in your memory bank. We'll come back to it. We have been spending several weeks, uh, just going to give you a little review, in John chapter 13 through 17, mostly 14 and 15. But in these times uh, where Jesus is speaking is immediately preceding his his death on the cross. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what? For his departure and for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he's preparing them so that they will be able to discern and live in the power and the will of the Holy Spirit. You have to understand what Jesus did was Jesus took a religion that had really become very fleshly. Jesus took a religion of Judaism, which was, it was a fleshly religion. It was do these things and then you're going to get this result. It was a religion of laws. And he took this religion of flesh and he transformed it into a relationship in the spirit. And he, he took a bunch of rules and he turned them into a relationship with the creator revealed in the level of the spirit of God himself. The Christian walk, church, is a spiritual walk. It is not a fleshly walk. It's a spiritual walk. 
And you say, well, I'm spiritual, therefore I must be Christian. Those aren't necessarily synonymous either, all right? Because just because you're spiritual, okay, you have awareness of a spiritual reality. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity has an awareness of spiritual reality. It has to do with which spirit we're seeking. In Christianity, we are seeking the Holy Spirit. We are seeking the spirit of Elohim, of God Almighty, the Creator, of Yahweh, the Great I Am. I'm not just trying to be aware that there's a spiritual universe around me. I am seeking the one who is the author and inventor of it all. Jesus, the the Lord came and he revealed himself in word here. He revealed himself in flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he reveals himself in the spirit of the Holy Spirit. And so we are after, church, we are after discovering who is this Holy Spirit. How do I live with this promise of the Spirit of God coming into my life. That's the transition the disciples had to make. They were going to have to learn, right? This wasn't an option. Learning to live in the power and the, and the, the leading of the Holy Spirit was not an option for them moving forward. How many of you guys have bought a new car, right? You get options, right? Way, way back when, a passenger side visor was an option. You could pay extra money and get a passenger side visor. You could get a heater. And then air conditionings were optional. And then I got this little old Toyota pickup. When I first got it, my boys got in there and like, what's this thing on the door, Dad? What does that do? Because <laughs> power windows used to be an option, okay? How many of you guys know the motor is not an option in any car? Like, <laughs> do I have to pay extra for that, really? Can I get like a Flintstone deal? Like... No, the motor is not an option. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is not an option for believers. It is essential. It is the very core foundation of what it means to walk with God. And Jesus is preparing these men to learn to live in the power of the Spirit. And so we've been talking, and I know, Brian, you reviewed a hundred times. Well, here's 101. Okay? Because it's got to sink in, right? And in this section of Scripture where John 13, 14, 15, 16, Jesus, he's so much talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And what we see here is that he's saying, look, you need to understand that the primary role of the Holy Spirit is not to give you superpowers. You don't seek him so that you can tell the future. You don't seek him so that you can put your hands on somebody and they're going to get up and walk or so that you can speak in tongues. Those things may come, but we seek him because his desire is to make you into the likeness of Christ. And so if we want to become as Christ is, if we want to know in a world of spiritual warfare what spirit is at work inside of us, we had better know the one in whom we are trying to emulate and become. And every week I've been giving you readings. I'm hoping that you're spending time in the Word of God to discover who Jesus is so that we are not led astray. Because you know what? We got a, a huge identity theft problem in our world. There's a huge identity theft problem in the spiritual world too. And if we don't know who we're serving, we don't know what spirit is at work in us. So we talked about lean, leaning in and knowing we can discern the spirits by knowing Jesus because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Talk about revelation and how the Spirit speaks in the deepest part of who we are. We can't rehash this, but church, we don't figure it out and get it down in here. It's revealed in here and comes out of our mind and our hearts and our lives. We talked about the desperation of the disciples in these moments and how they had recognized how all of their earthly wisdom and their resources and everything they had thought was total lies. It was totally wrong. All that they had reckoned and all that they had reasoned. But yet Jesus had it right. Because he was revealing the source, he was receiving a source of truth that they weren't. It was the spirit of truth. And then on Easter we got to celebrate just recognizing the power of the Holy Spirit. That when we think it's over, the Holy Spirit goes. Now it's time to have some fun. And that's why we never lose hope. That's why we never quit. 
That's why we, per we persevere through all things, because we know that the Spirit of God shows off best, reveals itself best when all things seem lost. And so we're, we're learning, we're dabbling in, as Jesus reveals to these men in these last days of his ministry on earth, what's it going to be like? How do I discern? How do I know the Holy Spirit? And today, actually today and next week, I want to spend a couple weeks talking to you about living in the love of Jesus. The necessity for us to live in the love of Jesus. Again, John 13 through 17, where we've been focusing a lot of red letters here. It starts with what I read during communion. Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, and he just begins to spill his heart for these men. And then it turns in John chapter 17, there is this prayer which Jesus prays for his disciples. It's his last prayer that he offers before he's arrested for the disciples. And I went through and I began to count, and so I probably made a mistake, but I think I got pretty close. But in these five chapters, I counted how many times Jesus mentions the word love in terms of love between him and the Father, love between us and him, us and the Father, us and one another, how many times this word love was mentioned? I counted 32, you know, give or take seven or eight, no. It was probably pretty close to 32, okay? 32 times in five chapters, do you think there's a theme developing here? Do you think that this might be something, if we're talking about learning to live in the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was trying to embed in his disciples that they would learn how to live in this love. And it's not new. This is a consolidated area. It's not new. We know what was the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so over the next couple of weeks, I want to dive in to two elements of love or two uh, directions of love, and that is loving God and loving others. And some of you say, well, there's three. You've got to love yourself, too. Well, that's probably true, but we're not going to probably talk about that. We're going to talk about loving God and loving others because it's expressed a little different, okay? And so these next couple weeks, I want to talk about living in the love of Christ. This week, I want to talk about directing that and what that looks like in our operations with the Lord. And next week, we're going to attempt to talk about what that looks like with one another. I'm going to talk more about um, what I'm about to mention here next week. But one of, the, one of the things that's interesting about this word love is that it's very loosely translated and used in the English language, right? You guys have heard this before. Um, when we talk about the word love, we could mean a myriad of things. I love pizza. And I love my wife. I love it when the beavers win. Right? And I love my children. I love my country. I love God. I hope those all mean a little different thing. <laughs> Got it? We use the same word, but it's flexible. But here's why it's important. It's because how we define love determines how we express it. And we have this loose word in English. Again, we're going to talk about this more next week because I think one of the big problems that we have with expressing love to one another is that our definitions of love have been hijacked. We're going to go into that next week. But one of the things that's important for us is to really kind of hone in what Jesus is talking about here when he says to love one another, when he says that we are to love him. What does that mean and what does that look like? Now, this might be review for some of you. Uh, in fact, it's probably a review for all of you, but like I said, we have this loose English word of love, but in the Greek in which the New Testament was written, how many words are there for love? You remember? I hope there's four, because if there's not four, then I'm wrong. But I know there's at least four. How's that? Okay, there's four. And so they're a little bit more dialed in in terms of their, understand, of their, their use of words. And the first one is it's called a storge love. I always think of stork. I don't know why, but it's not anything to do with that. So storge is, it's simply an affection for that which is familiar. And this is your very basic, like, I love my cat. Like, I love it when my wife cooks dinner. I love it when I get to come to church and be with my friends. Something that is familiar to you that you have an affection for and that you enjoy. 
That is this storge love. If it's a simple affection for things that you appreciate or people that you appreciate, that word is not used by Jesus here. Another one is the eros love. And eros love is this romantic, oftentimes it's considered romantic or even a sexual love. It's actually where we get the word erotic uh, in the English language. <clears throat> and it, it's broader than that, but it really uses that in terms of it's an expression of passion. You can think of this as a very emotional love. It's one that you pour yourself into. And so obviously that can be romantic, but it can also be, you know, a, the gift of music. There's a lot of people that are very passionate about music, and they pour themselves, I eros music, I love to participate in it. Or whether it be dancing, or whether it be a sports activity, or, or something that you're passionate about participating in, that you give yourself passionately to. That's the eros love. Jesus does not use that. The other, another one is Philia. Have you guys heard the name Philadelphia? Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love because this is a brotherly love or a familial love. If you are in the trenches with a fellow soldier, if you have a, a brother or a sister or a friend, it's, it's not something that you have this deep emotional heart throb for, but it's someone that you care very deeply for. It's someone that has great value to you in life. This is your philia, love. And this is actually, I found it used actually once in this, in this dialogue that Jesus has, but it's not used of Jesus. It's actually used of the world. word. In John chapter 15, verse 19, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world and I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. That's, the only, that's where Jesus uses that word philia, the world's love. He says, basically, if you were not my followers, the world would value you. The world would see you as precious, but if you follow me, they're going to reject you and hate you. So he does use that word, but he doesn't really use it in terms of our relationship to one another, our relationship with Christ, his relationship with the Father. Which word do you think that he uses? Because there's only one left. Agape love. That's right. And this is the most familiar to us. This is the one that we, we talk about often. John also says in his epistle in 1 John chapter 4, he defines God as this. He says, God is agape. And very simply put, it is a selfless love. The Latin equivalent, and why your King James Bible oftentimes will say charity is because this is the closest that they could come to it because charity is what? It's the selfless giving of yourself or of your resources for someone else's benefit at your detriment and your cost and your sacrifice. This is the expression of agape love. And in the case of these few chapters, right, we have 32 references. This is the word that Jesus keeps going back to. It is this fully giving of oneself sacrificially unto another, completely surrendered to their interests above your own. John chapter 14, and we've read this verse before. We're diving a little bit deeper today. Verse 21, Jesus defines a little bit about what this looks like. <clears throat> and here's what he said. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who agape me, is the one who loves me. He who has my commandments and keeps them. What is the primary expression of love that Jesus is after here in terms of our love for him? Is it affection? Is it this storge love? Oh, that Jesus, he's my good buddy. I, I just appreciate it. I, I like him and I like his church and I like his people. It's, it's great to be around, just makes me feel like I'm at home. Nothing wrong with that, right? But that's not what Jesus is getting at. Jesus also doesn't say your greatest expression is, is worship. And I want you to have this eros love. I want you to just lose yourself in the moment and just become overwhelmed with emotion and passionately throw yourself at the altar. He doesn't say that. He also doesn't say, I want you to be so philea 
in love with me that you will just defend my honor, that you will be so deeply concerned about who I am, you're going to rise up to my defense, you're going to put the Bible in everybody's face, you're going to make sure you're on my mission because you value me so much, you're going to protect me and you're going to promote me and be my disciples to the end of the world. He doesn't say that's your greatest gift to me. He says, what I desire of you is agape. And it's agape that is expressed through having my word and keeping it. Let's shorten that up. Obedience. It is agape expressed through obedience. And both of these are important right now. We've got to think about this for a second, okay? Both of these are important because it's obedience expressed through this agape, this selfless love, not obedience without it. They go together. What's the difference? You guys remember, um, oh man, it was so many years ago. How many of you guys remember the Me Monster video from Brian Regan? Does anybody remember that? I'm going to have to show that again. You re- so I did show it here, right? I'm not just making that up. Okay, Brian Regan's hysterical. You can look him up. He's pretty clean. Um, but he does this whole comedy bit about the Me Monster. Everybody's got a Me Monster, right? Me, me, me. If we are not careful... The me monster in us will manipulate these things and make them not this agape selflessness, but a me monster selfishness. I believe that was in Martin's song. He talked about this difference of selflessness and selfishness. You know, so he calls us to obedience, and let's just think about a few of those things, you know. So, you know, we're, we're called to forgive. That would be keeping the words of Christ. Well, I, yeah, I, I need to forgive because if I don't forgive, well, then it's going to plague me. You know, what is it Mandela said, and I think he got it from Augustine, is that bitterness is a, is a poison that you drink and you expect it to kill your enemy. Well, I, I, mean, I don't want to carry around the bitterness of everything everybody else has done to me. I need to forgive so that I can be free of this resentment and this bitterness in my heart not because they're worthy of forgiveness or they should be forgiven, but because I need it. Yeah, me monster came out a little bit. What about giving generously? Well, I've read Malachi, and I happen to know that if I give my tithes, my my warehouses are going to overflow, so I am just going to give, and I'm going to wait. Because I can't afford not to give. It's the best investment I'm ever going to make. And so I'm not actually giving... For the sake of giving, I'm giving because I'm what? I'm expecting something in return. The me monster. Pray for your enemies. Well, I suppose if I pray for my enemies and they get better, it's better for me. I don't really want to, but, you know, it would probably improve my lot in life if we could take care of a few things. So I will because of the reward I get. Or enduring persecution. Well, what's the opposite of that? Uh, I don't even want to think about what the opposite of that. Give it up. Like, I don't want to give up, right? I'm going to endure it because that's better for me or going forth, preaching the gospel, making disciples. Well, I suppose the world will be a better place and I'll have a lot more points in heaven and say, see, look what I did. And so we do it. We're obedient. But why? And we, if we actually look at this crazy, selfish flesh of ours that twists and manipulates things, we find out I'm actually being obedient to Christ, but I'm doing it without agape. I'm doing it in a selfishness. I'm doing it not for the sake of Christ, but for the sake of myself. And when we do this, it exposes something in our heart, and it begs the question, am I obeying the commands of Christ because the need is worthy of my sacrifice or because the, wor- because the reward is worthy of my sacrifice? Am I obeying Christ because the one who asks is worthy of my gift or because I feel it will make me worthy of the, re- of the reward that I will receive The me monster makes its debut. You see, the me monster will never love greater than the reward he or she can see. 
because we always need to see the reward first. In other words, the problem with functioning in this way is that our obedience to Christ is going to be limited by the reward in which we can see because we're only willing to obey by that which we know we will receive back. And if it goes beyond what we can see, our obedience stops. Let's talk about prayer. You know, one of the things about prayer is it's hard. It's hard to give you, we, we like to think of prayer as dynamite. I want to put dynamite at the bottom of a tree, hit it once, watch it blow up, and say timber. But prayer is a whole lot more like axes, isn't it? Chop, and we chop, and we chop, and we chop. And one day, it begins to creak, and the next day, it begins to fall, and it breaks out and answers. But a lot of times we get there and we will we'll pray a couple times and we'll walk away. We'll walk away from prayer. Why? Because I can't see any reward. I can't see anything happen. And I'm not going to give myself selflessly to something that I'm not going to get a reward from. So I'm going to spend my time elsewhere doing other things. You see, we can't actually pray earnestly. We can't actually intercede well if we're only willing to love as far as the reward in which we could see we're limited by the me monster. And it's only in when we break into selfless prayer in which that person, that need, our Savior, is worthy of the cry of our heart that we're able to persevere to the point of breakthrough. We're limited by what we can see. Or singing worship, right? We come here every Sunday and we sing, right? And so often we sing to the measure of which we receive back. If I'm really feeling it and it's good and I'm getting this little dopamine rush and, you know, the arrows is moving and, man, I'm going to really pour out myself. But if I'm not getting anything back, I'm not putting anything in because why? I'm going to lean in. I'm going to give as much as the reward of which I'm receiving in the moment. And it just doesn't make sense for me to cry out when I'm not getting anything back. And so oftentimes we don't worship selflessly. We worship in measure to what we receive. What about reading the scriptures? I mean, how many of you have struggled to open this up and read it every day? And you go, oh, I've read this before. Oh, I've read that before. Yeah, we kind of flip through it. And and this becomes a discipline, it becomes a challenge, and we say, well, I'm not really, I don't get anything out of it, I don't know what I learned today, I forget it by the time I go to lunch, and so what do we do? We stop sacrificially loving and obedience and trying to know the person of Christ, trying to know our Creator, because why? We can't see the fruit of the reward, and I'm only willing to give to the degree in which I can see the reward that's coming back to me. Do you see why agape is important? Do you see why this selfless love of obedience is important? Because if we don't have agape, if we're not willing to give selflessly in our love, it will limit what we give to our Creator. I talked to a friend of mine not too long ago, and, you know, same challenges that so many of us face. He said, oh, I'm sending some money over. I should have sent it earlier, but I was just, I didn't know... <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to be okay there for a while. I needed to get a couple things taken care of. And I shouldn't have. I should have trusted God better. And I says, you know, man, we're all human. And he li he's living in that tension of, I don't want to lean too far and find that I've fallen into the abyss. I, I've got to, keep, got, to keep my, got to keep my post vertical. I gotta, I gotta, gotta keep it more upright here. That's just not gonna work, you know. And it's the same thing. I think about, you know, all the challenges and the things that we face. Those things that the Lord leads us into, and we just begin to question and we struggle. Church, we struggle to lean into obedience. We struggle to lean into obedience. You know, when you're working through marital issues. And you begin to sense how you should treat your spouse. And you try it for two days. You try it for three days. You try it for a week. You try it for a month. You try it for a year. And nothing changes. And we say, I can't see the reward. I'm pulling back, right? And we're actually pulling back out of agape. Or adopting children. One of the greatest calls, I think, is the, to adopt children. And yet it's such a challenging, challenging thing. 
And I think so many people are scared out of adoption because of some of the things that have happened. And we try to see, well, you know, what, what's the reward consequence? What's the reward consequence? And God is calling us into this agape, this selfless, to stop looking about what you're going to get back. Because here's the deal. I'm going to ask you to lean farther than what you can see. I'm going to ask you to surrender past the point into the darkness. I'm going to ask you to stop standing straight, but to lean to the point in which if I don't catch you, you won't be caught. I'm calling you into an agape obedience where you are going to trust yourself unto me. And here's what Jesus says is is so cool. He finishes this sentence. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And listen, he goes on, he says, and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. In other words, when you lean in, when you begin to break, when you walk into not obedience without agape, the obedience of agape. Moving to the place where if I took your other supports, you would fall. He says it's in that moment, it's in that place where you will find my strength, where you will meet me, and where you will, I will disclose myself to you. But if you're only willing to lean so far as the rewards in which you can see, you will never discover the true strength and the true leadership of the Holy Spirit. I remember my first real um, encounter with a decision like this. I feel like I was sharing this story not too long ago. Maybe that's why it's on my mind. But <clears throat> between my freshman and sophomore year of college, I switched schools. I went from George Fox to Warner Pacific. And I went to George Fox originally uh, to play baseball because I thought I was going to be a baseball player because people told me I was going to be a baseball player, and, well, I didn't. So um, funny how that happens, right? And it took the Lord a year to break me, and about the second semester, I began sensing that I needed to change to Warner Pacific. And I didn't want to go there. That's why I didn't. Otherwise, I would have. And I had to develop this group of friends that was unlike anything I'd ever had in my life. You know, I had like seven youth pastors growing up, kind of some dysfunctional church issues going on, didn't have really any friends at school that I would call real friends. And I had this core group of friends that actually loved me. And I'd never, I had it in my family, but I'd never had people that actually chose it, right? There's a difference. I was chosen by birth, but I mean, they chose it, they they loved me. And I just remember wrestling with this, not having a clue about what I was falling into. It's like everything, I had, the only thing that seemed to make sense was it was a little bit cheaper. That was it. Everything else was a, everything else was a bust. Uh, music program, the, the, the education, the people that I was with, the campus. Sorry, I'm not bashing anybody. Just say it. Everything in my mind seemed better to stay. And I, I ultimately ended up making that decision because I felt the Lord was calling me to transfer. And I just remember driving. Have you ever been, come out of Woodburn or, or a Newburgh, right? And you're going up the big hill there on 99? bawling my eyes out the last day with a little Toyota pickup full of junk saying, Lord, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And I had no idea what was going to catch me on the other side. That was my first experience of this agape obedience where the Lord was tugging and I said, I don't know what I'm leaning into, but I know you're calling me to lean. And if you don't catch me, I'm going to fall on my face. And I leaned, and I can't even tell you, my life is forever molded by that decision. The little boys that you see running around with me, the cute little blonde girl, (laughs) the 17 years that I've served here with you, all goes back to that moment. You know, this agape love It's agape obedience. We have to take our eyes. It's really hard. It's really hard. We have to take our eyes off of what's going to catch me. 
to really experience the reality of it. And it is so hard because the me monster, the flesh in us, desires so much security. And yet he's calling us into an obedience that causes us to lean into the darkness and know that he's going to catch us. But that's where we really begin to walk with him, to find our strength, to find his strength, right? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. You know, Abraham, when he took Isaac up, that was agape obedience, total selflessness. What about Joseph? Continuing to serve even in the midst of that prison cell. What was going to catch him on the other side? What about Ruth, who went with Naomi? She had no idea what was there. She left her home. She gleaned for Boaz, and look what caught her on the other side. She had no ability to see the reward that was before her. See, rewards aren't bad things. Rewards are good things. But Jesus is calling us to a selfless gift of ourselves. What did, Daniel, what did Samuel see when he appointed David? <laughs> Or what did Jehoshaphat see when the Lord said, send out your marching band first to the armies? What about the calling of Isaiah? Here am I, send me. Or Jeremiah, who knew that he was going to prophesy in a time of destruction. What did Mary think when she was given this gift of this premarital baby? (laughs) May it be to me as you have said. And today we talked about the foot washing that Jesus did just giving selflessly and trusting, trusting that when we begin to fall, we're going to find that we're far more stable leaning in than we ever were standing on our own. Jesus, uh, this is a subject that hits us all in different ways, and, and I just ask, Lord, that as we close our time as we go through our day that this spirit of God would begin to move in us and would begin to speak to our hearts about calling us to a different life. That you would tug our hearts not only in the big things like college decisions but in the small things where we spend our time what we do with our days, what phone calls we make, how we interact with our coworkers how we love our spouses and our children or our neighbors. And that we would not only lean so far as we can see the reward, but in a selfless agape, help us to just give ourselves. And Lord, we know that you'll be there to catch us. And that when we fall into you, we will be diving into a deeper revelation of your love of your goodness and of your will for our lives that we will never discover when we try to stand on our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand? <clears throat> All to Jesus I surrender
Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads them forth and hosts by number, and he calls them by name. Because of the greatness of his might and his strength and his power, not one of them is missing. So why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord, and that the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Oh, do you not know, and have you not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not grow weary, and he does not grow tired. His understanding is inscrutable, and he gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Youths will grow weary and tired, and vigorous men will stumble and fall. Yet those who wait in the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Jesus, today I just want to pray a special prayer over those who are weary because of trying to live in this agape love, but the flesh is failing. And it's harder and harder every day. And I ask, Jesus, that you would meet us in this place of weariness. I ask that you would meet us in this place of difficulty, that as we lean into obedience and doing those things which you have placed in our heart to do, God, that you would grant us this strength that you have promised, this resolve and this hope this day, and that you would meet us in the place of our falling and not let us fall or stumble. Jesus, I pray a special encouragement to those who are discouraged today because we hear these words, but yet we haven't experienced them. And I ask, Jesus, that you would divinely meet them, that you would come and you would fulfill their pro this promise in their life, that Jesus, you yourself, would reveal yourself in the hardships and in the trials and in the uncertainty and in the mystery. And as we continue to look toward you and lean in, even when we think, Lord, the clock has expired, fill us with resurrection power, we pray. Jesus, renew our faith this day in your goodness, in your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you over to lunch over here. And if you are uh, a guest or really new to our church and I haven't met you yet, I'm going to hang out at the Welcome Center. I'd love to meet you back there.